Howdy, everybody. The last two episodes were pretty jam-packed with information as we were talking about a very technical thing called Treesitter. We're going to tone it down a little bit in this episode. There will still be a lot of information, don't you worry about that. However, it's not going to be as nuanced, nor is it going to be as technical, I hope, as the previous two episodes were. So this is sort of a break episode before we delve yet again into more technical territory, which is going to be LSP. In this episode, I want to discuss two different things. I want to explain buffers, windows and tabs, which is going to be the first part of this episode and in the second part I would like to discuss the differences between all of the different ways of setting a new Vim option because in the last episode I believe or maybe two episodes ago I alluded to the fact that Vim.opt is not the only way of setting a new Vim option and that there's actually a vast array of many different ways of doing the same thing basically and so in this episode we are also going to delve into that and I'm going to explain and kind of tame the madness that is the 25 different tables uh, that we can access to set or get new Vim option but first of all buffers, windows, and tabs. Why am I explaining this? Well, first of all, this is a built-in thing within NeoVim. It has been also in Vim since eternity. It is a very good thing to be able to leverage and to know how to use to your advantage, especially tabs. Those are easily the most underused feature within NeoVim. Granted, they are a bit complicated at times to programmatically, you know, interact with, but don't worry, I'm going to explain as much as I can right now. Buffers, windows, and tabs are a way for NeoVim to store and display data that exists within NeoVim, specifically files, right? And mostly files. There are also cases where you can use these three for plugins, for example, for displaying quote unquote virtual data or data that doesn't exist on disk, like UIs or different like toggleable actions, clickable buttons and so on. Most of your interactions within NeoVim are going to be with files. You're going to be editing a file, saving a file and reading many different files throughout your entire lifespan of using NeoVim. So let's start off with the lowest level structure down at the very bottom. I'm going to whip out the visualizations for this video because learning buffers, windows and tabs is the easiest when you have something visual that represents what I'm talking about. So at the very bottom we have buffers. Buffers store text and that is literally it. So they aren't a way for us to see the text or display the text in any sort of way. We can't see the contents of a buffer without the help of a window. The buffer itself is just the raw data or in other words the file contents of a file that you might have just opened. Like a text file, um, you know, a markdown file file or even a binary file, all of that stuff is stored within a buffer. Now a buffer isn't actually as simple as just storing the entire contents in a single contiguous array of memory. Buffers are a bit more of a complicated data structure as they need to be able to deal with edits and operations that might seem easy to your eye, but when a computer has to do it, it is vastly more complicated. However, what should be important to you is the buffer is just the text, all right? Nothing more, nothing less. If we want to view the buffer, if we want to see it within our our NeoVim editor, right, and be able to hence physically interact with it. We need the help of our good friend, the window. The job of the window is to quite literally give us a window, a view onto a portion of the buffer. Sometimes it can be the whole thing. I mean, if your file is very short, you know, it's going to display the whole buffer. However, most of the time, if your file is long, it's only going to be displaying a portion. Now, the reason why NeoVim makes this distinction is because windows can come in many different shapes and sizes. You can have, you know, the regular window, but you can also have splits and you can have floating windows and those things can be on any position, any pixel on the screen. So it's important that windows aren't actually bound to files in any way. They're simply a way for us to see a portion of a file. A cool way of thinking about how these two interact with each other is to think that NeoVim stores all of the buffers next to each other, side by side, on a sort of tape, right? And you can move the tape left and right and above that tape is your window. And the window shows you a view onto a given part of the tape, or in other words, on a specific buffer. You can manipulate which buffer is currently being shown by using the bnext and bprev or bprev, however you want to pronounce that, commands. Those two will cycle between the list. It will move the tape right and it will move the tape left depending on which command you executed. And this is generally how you navigate files within stock NeoVim without the help of any plugins. Now during the development of Vim, the developers realized, hang on, we can do one better than that. And so they invented the uncle of Windows, which we will call tabs. Tabs, or sometimes also referred to as tab pages, they are the same thing, are a window onto your windows. Or more specifically, they are a container 
that can contain any amount of windows within. So this means when you create three different windows in a split, like you can have two windows in a split and then one which is a floating window, all of that is contained within a tab. And you can switch between different tabs, basically allowing you to have many different layouts and configurations of windows for any specific use case that you might need. This is especially useful if you're working on two completely different code bases and you want to entirely isolate one part of one set of windows from another set of windows, right? The first set of windows is going to be showing files from the first code base, and then the second set is going to be showing files from the second code base. So it seems quite simple how all of this comes together in the end, isn't it? You have a buffer at the bottom, you can view parts of the buffer using the window, and you can have many windows stacked next to each other together inside of a tab. Now I'm explaining this because this is where the chaos comes into play. Because we have these three different things, we can set options individually for each of those different things. You can set an option for a buffer only, right? So that option is going to only affect the buffer. You can also set a specific option for a given window only. So it's only going to affect the behavior of that specific window. And the same goes for tab pages. And then in the end, you also have global options that will affect absolutely everything, no matter what tab, what window, and what buffer you're in. And because of this, we have a vast array of many different tables that we can access to edit these options. And you're probably looking at your screen right now and you might be a bit perplexed but let's not be too afraid and let's take a look at all of these tables and see what sort of information we can extract from their names so that we can sort these things out in our head and clear things up a little bit more. So currently this is a massive garble of many different tables. We can access these tables just like we can access vim.opt and uh, we can modify any specific variable inside of these tables and that is going to correspond to setting either a variable or an option for a given buffer window or tab page. Hang on, did I just say variables and options? Yes, those are two different things and we can kind of start seeing uh, the differences here now. You'll notice that a lot of these tables on this list like vim.t, vim.b, vim.w, they have a corresponding counterpart which is vim.bo, vim.wo and vim.to. We can assume that the o stands for options so now we can try to divide this mess into two different groups. Let's start off with dividing the tables that do not have an O suffix on the left side and let's put the rest on the right hand side. So this seems like a nice distinction now. So what's the difference between variables and options? As a general user and as somebody who might not be developing NeoVim plugins throughout their lifespan, good on you, you're going to mostly be using the options tables. Why? Because you only care about changing NeoVim's behavior, right? That's in the end why you're writing a configuration because you want to configure stuff. So we are going to be using the vim some letter o tables more commonly then we're going to be using the tables on the left list here. However, it would be a shame to not explain what variables are. Back in the olden times when dinosaurs were still roaming the earth uh, and VimScript was still in general use, VimScript would divide its variables into many different scopes and these scopes would tell the variable for how long it should exist in memory before essentially deleting itself. And these scopes happen to be the global scope, the buffer scope, the window scope, and the tab scope. Hmm, well, that sounds eerily familiar, doesn't it? This looks exactly like the list of tables that we have over here, with a few extra ones. So variables are only useful for storing data. For example, let's say I wanted to store some data for a given buffer, and only for that given buffer. I could use the vim.b table, and I could assign some sort of variable within the vim.b table to a value, and whenever I'm interested in retrieving the value, I can use the vim.b table again, but I can also supply a buffer ID. So this is an identifier of the buffer. Each buffer has its own unique number. The same goes for windows and also tabs. They're all given unique numbers. And then by supplying the buffer number, I can retrieve the value for a specific buffer. And I can, for example, use that in some sort of code that I might have written. The same goes for windows tab pages. The global scope, however, vim.g is used everywhere. So whatever you put inside of here is going to be there essentially throughout the entire NeoVim runtime. So as long as you have NeoVim open, this variable is going to be set and it can be accessed from anywhere from any any code within NeoVim. Glad that we have those explained and now we can move on to the options. The options work very similar, however they are a tiny bit more complicated as not every option can be set for every single type of value. And what I mean by this is you can have an option which can be set for a buffer However, that cannot be set for a window, for example, or that can only be set for a window but cannot be set for a buffer. 
And the reason is, buffers, windows, and tabs all have different behaviors, and so they all have different options that can control those behaviors. It wouldn't make sense to change an option that is specifically related to a window on a buffer. That does not make any sense. If you would like to see what sort of object you can apply an option to, you can look at the help page for that given option, and it will tell you. It will tell you that the option is, for example, local to the buffer. So if you are ever curious on how to set an option and where to set this option, well now you know. Consult the help pages is always the answer within Neovim. So with the different scoped options is what I'm going to call them, or in other words, options that explicitly define a scope, stuff like buffer, windows, tabs. If you don't supply a parameter and you, for example, do vim.wo.sum value equals to some other value, what that's going to do is that's going to alter the window option for the current window that is active within Neovim. However, sometimes you might want to be a tiny bit more explicit with the window that you would like to set. And if you have already obtained a window ID or a buffer ID of any specific buffer or window that you'd like to change, you can supply that ID inside of square brackets. And this acts as an accessor. It's called a meta accessor, but that's a bit out of the scope still of this series. We need to go a few more episodes in before I explain meta accessors and meta tables. However, the gist of it is, if you supply an ID of a window or a buffer, it's going to affect only that window or buffer. If you omit this accessor, you are going to instead make changes to the current thing that's open. This could be a buffer, a window, tab page. You get the idea. So now let's explain vim.o. Vim.o is easily the most complicated one, which is ironic because theoretically uh, in the code vim.opt is the thing that does the most lifting under the hood but that's actually what makes it the easiest vim.o is basically the hardcore mode of vim.opt it just like everything else allows you to set an option however it does not set or specify any sort of scope so what that means is that neovim is automatically going to look at the option that you provide or the option that you'd like to set it's going to check what scope that option supports and then it is going to perform the modifications for that specific thing. So for example, for the window that you might be interested in. Now this is awesome, but it can also be very confusing. And to understand why it's confusing, we need to take a look at a different type of scope. We need to take a look at the global local scope. Yes, that's right. We're starting to get into this sort of territory right now. So within NeoVim, there can be options, which can be both global options, i.e. they can be set for the entire NeoVim instance, but they can also optionally be set locally locally for a specific buffer or for a specific window. And a very practical example that's provided to us by the help pages is the make PRG option. The make PRG option is an option that specifies what program NeoVim should run when trying to compile a file. And this is useful if you're a programmer and you're writing stuff in a compiled language, you can specify the make program, which will basically act as your compiler for that given session. You can imagine it would be cool if you could set a global program that every single file is going to use whenever you invoke the make command, uh, but it would also sometimes be nice to be able to override that variable just for a single buffer. So just when you're editing this one file, it's going to use a different command and it's going to execute something completely different on your system in order to compile program. This is the example of a global local variable. It can exist in both states. It can be global everywhere, or you can be more specific for a specific buffer, and that's the local part of it. So this is now where it gets crazy. Whenever we use vim.o, what we're actually doing is we're setting both the global option if it's available and both the local option if it's available. This is the behavior of vim.o. First of all, if you set some sort of option, it's going to first check, is there a global version of this option? If it is, it's going to set it to the value you're interested in. But also, if there's a local version of the option, it's also going to set that. And this is to prevent any sort of confusion. In my opinion, it just ends up being more confusing, but it's supposed to prevent confusion, okay? Additionally, when we use vim.o, we don't have any access to the same utility functions like append, prepend, or remove like we do with vim.opt. Vim.o strictly returns whatever value is underneath the option. It doesn't give us any sort of functions that we can use to operate on these. It is literally just the value and we can just edit this value and that's it. I would say that you should use vim.o the least if possible. Use vim.opt like we have been doing throughout the entire series for as much as you can. However, if you need to be a bit more specific, if you need to specify an individual buffer or an individual window, then use the BO, WO, or TO options. For your own sanity, just don't touch vim.o unless you know you absolutely have to or unless you're actually seeking the behavior that it provides. Okay, two more things left on the list. We are almost there, almost at the end. These are vim.opt local 
and vim.opt global. Since these are prefixed with opt, they are very easy. So you don't have to worry about any weird edge cases or behaviors with these. Just like vim.opt, they have all of the niceties implemented so you can breathe a sigh of relief and know that things aren't going to do three backflips on you whenever you least expect it. Opt local only sets the local version of an option. So if that option is already explicitly only local to a buffer, for example, it's just going to set that and it's not going to argue with you. However, if the option is weird and it is global local, it is going to instead set only the local version of the option. It is not going to touch the global definition of the option that you know you wanted to change. Opt global is the polar opposite. It is not going to touch any local definitions of an option. However, it is going to change the global version if it exists and if that is applicable. If not, it is simply going to fall back to setting the local option instead, which is fantastic. I mean, these tables just kind of do all of the thinking for you. And uh, yeah, they just prevent common bugs and errors that uh, you know you otherwise might encounter. And now to tie everything all together and to end where we started, vim.opt is the culmination of vim.opt local and vim.opt global. Vim.opt is going to set both the global version of an option as well as the local version of an option. Or if it's not weird and it doesn't have this global local discrepancy, it is just going to set the option for you. It's that simple. And this is why use vim.opt where you can, unless you need something more specific from the stuff that you learned in this video, in which case you can use that specific table to change whatever you need. So to recap, vim.opt absolutely everywhere, or if you need to change an option for a buffer only, then uh, use vim.bo. If you need to change an option for a window only, use vim.wo. And if you're one of the few people who use tabs, then use vim.to. Hopefully I did not overload you with information in this episode. I mean, if I did, feel free to ask a question in the comments and I'll be responding to you know as many things as I can. Really excited for the LSP videos. Uh, those require you know quite a lot of fact checking and research to make sure i'm not going off track anywhere thank you so much for watching and i'll see you in the next video ciao